We are very excited about a special loan that's coming to the museum to help us celebrate the inauguration of our new African art galleries. And the loan comes to us from Madagascar and it's this absolutely beautiful textile made from the most astonishing material. It's made from the silk of the golden orb spider. The creators of the spider silk textile, Simon Pierce and Nicholas Godley, longtime residents of Madagascar, became fascinated by the history of weaving with spider silk. The dream of harvesting spider silk and weaving with it is something that's very ancient, but it was explored anew in the 18th century by the French um, who were interested in finding a way to um, take business away from the Chinese who were weaving with, with silkworm silk. A French missionary named Father Paul Cambouet was in Madagascar in the 19th century using local Malagasy weavers who were um, uh, enrolled at the École Professionnelle, set about to weave a grand weaving that could be displayed at the Exposition Universelle in Paris. This was one of these sort of colonial world's fairs. They made hangings for a bed, all woven from spider silk that was harvested in Madagascar. It was a huge hit. However, these weavings have since gone missing. Nobody knows what happened to them. And from that period in time until today, nobody um, has successfully woven with spider silk. Spider silk has amazing physical properties. It's extremely elastic, is extremely strong, stronger than Kevlar. But these things make it very challenging to weave with, with human hands. The other reason it's extremely challenging to work with, of course, is that spiders are impossible to domesticate. To gather enough spider silk to make a textile has proven to be almost impossible. The golden orb spider lives primarily in Madagascar. The female spider is about the size of a human palm. The females weave these massive six to seven foot webs. When you see these giant webs, it, it's not that far a step to think what would it be like to have a textile made from that. It took them uh, a group of 80 people five years to collect enough silk to make this large panel. In the silking process, the, the spiders are collected and they're taken to a building and the silk is pulled from their abdomen and then they're returned to the wild. They actually set the spider into a little cone and you can just see the spider being inserted. Its legs are wrapped to protect the spider so it doesn't get injured. The silk is extruded from the spider and they have a little machine that spins multiple strands together to make a thread. In the panel, each warp is made from 96 individual strands of spider silk. You really get a sense of how difficult this material is to work with because you can just see these diaphanous spider strand, silk strands kind of floating around the hands of these individuals. Each brocading weft, and the brocade is the, the thicker um, pattern that you see on the textile, each brocading weft has 10 of those threads together, so each one has 960 spider silk strands in it. There were a group of five men, all expert weavers, who wove the panels that are sewn together to make the overall large panel. The weaver is working with these shuttles that are being used to lay in the brocading weft. He picks up 
the warp in a specific order to create the pattern. Included in the textile are traditional patterns for the luxury textiles that were made. So these are traditional patterns that um, exist in textiles made from silk in the 19th century and they're being revisited here in this contemporary um, textile. And then the finishing of the textile, the sewing together of the panels, the sewing on of the band on either end of the large panel, and then the braiding of the fringe was done by a group of women. And when you put all of that together, um, you end up with a panel that contains over a million strands of spider silk in it. When we look at different types of fibers to gain a greater understanding, we look at how fibers are shaped or their morphology. Um, so to do that, we mounted um, spider silk fibers from the golden orb spider and s cultivated silkworm fibers from the bombyx mori onto microscope slides and viewed them under magnification um, with partially cross-polarized light to help enhance their structural uh, properties or attributes. In the photomicrograph of the cross-sections of the golden orb spider silk, we see a cluster of round spots um, of varying sizes. And a particular note, the, the fibers are extremely circular. In the cross-section of the cultivated silkworm fibers, on the other hand, the cross-section shape is triangular. Um, the blue fibers surrounding the center yellow fibers um, are mercerized cotton, which is just filler to help hold the silkworm fibers in place when they're cut. When we look at the um, fibers in a longitudinal view with partially crossed polars, we gain even more information. Uh, the images of the, of the spider silk fibers show two distinct fiber types. There is a, a thinner white or colorless fiber, it appears white under partially crossed polars, and a slightly thicker, more homogeneously yellow fiber. The colorless fiber is minor ampullate fiber, while the yellow fiber is the dragline fiber, which may be more familiar because that is the fiber with all of the incredible physical properties of strength and elasticity. When we look at the longitudinal views of the cultivated silkworm fibers, we see one fiber type. Um, it is also colorless, although it appears somewhat rainbow hued due to the partially crossed polars. We also note in comparing the two fiber types that the silk worm fi fibers are far thicker. The scientific community has become very interested in the potentials of spider silk. In the military and the medical arenas, they are experimenting with creating synthetic spider silk. They've been unsuccessful thus far at creating a product that's as perfect as the silk that comes out of the spider itself. There's something that, you know, that what happens within the spider is so amazing and it's so good at doing what it's meant to do. You can think about this contemporary textile as a bookend to some of the oldest works of art in the collection are ancient terracottas from what is today Mali. The horse and rider is, is also about internationalism and the role of trade and um, exchange in the history of the African continent. The multinational character of this textile, I think, is very telling of contemporary Africa, a place that is very much involved in and connected with the world at large. I wanted to bring the textile here hopefully to inspire people to think about these facets of Africa today as they also look at the permanent collection and think about tradition and Africa's remarkable past.